So we're going to be talking about um, GANs today. Who has heard of GANs? Yeah, about most of you. Very hot technology, um, but definitely deserving to be in the cutting edge deep learning part of the course because they're not quite proven to be necessarily useful for anything, but they're nearly there. They're definitely going to get there, and we're going to focus on the things where um, they're definitely definitely going to be useful in practice, and there's a number of areas where they may turn out to be useful in practice, but we don't know yet. So I think the area that we're going to be, uh, that they're definitely going to be useful in practice is uh, the kind of thing you see on the left here, which is, uh, for example, turning drawings into rendered pictures. Uh, this comes from a paper that uh, just came out uh, two days ago. Uh, so there's a very active research going on um, right now. Uh, before we get there, though, let's talk about some uh, interesting stuff from the last class. Um, this is an interesting thing that um, one of our diversity fellows, Christine Payne, did. Christine um, has a, a, a master's in medicine from Stanford, and so she obviously had an interest in thinking, what would it look like if we built a language model of medicine. Um, and one of the things that we briefly touched on back in lesson four, but didn't really talk much about last time, is this idea you can actually seed a generative language model, which basically means you've trained a language model on some corpus, and then you're going to generate some text from that language model. And so you can start off by feeding it a few words, you know, to basically say here's, this, here's the first few words to create the hidden state. In the language model, and then generate from there, please. And so when Christine, um, so Christine did something uh, uh, clever, which was to kind of uh, pick a, uh, was to seed it with a question, and then repeat the question so three times, Christine, three times, and then let it generate from there. Um, and so she uh, fed a language model lots of different medical texts, and then fed it this question: What is the prevalence of malaria? And the model said. Uh, in the US, about 10% of the population uh, has the virus, but only about 1% uh, is infected with the virus, about 50 to 80 million infected. She said, what's the treatment for ectopic pregnancy? And it said it's a safe uh, and safe treatment for women with a history or symptoms that may have a significant impact on clinical response. Most important factor is the uh, development and management of ectopic pregnancies, etc. And so what I find interesting about this is, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty close to being a uh, to, to me, as somebody who doesn't have a master's in medicine from, from Stanford, a pretty kind of close to being a believable answer to the question, um, but it really has no bearing on reality whatsoever. And I kind of think it's an interesting uh, kind of ethical and user experience quandary. Um, so actually, uh, uh, I'm involved also in a company called Doc.ai that's trying to basically well, do a number of things, but in the end. Uh, provide a, an app for doctors and patients which can help kind of create a conversational user interface around uh, helping them with their medical issues. And I've been kind of continually saying to the software engineers on that team, please don't try to create a, a generative model using like an LSTM or something because they're going to be really good at creating bad advice that sounds impressive, you know, <laughs> kind of like, you know, political pundits or tenured professors, you know, people who um, can say bullshit with great authority. Um, so I think, um, yeah, so I thought it was really, I thought it was a really interesting um, experiment. Um, and great to see, you know, uh, what, what our diversity fellows are, are doing. I mean, this is why we have this program. Um, I suppose I shouldn't just say masters in medicine, actually a Juilliard trained classical musician. Uh, well, I'm actually also a Princeton valedictorian in physics, so also a high-performance computing expert. Uh, yeah, okay, so she does a bit of everything. Um, so yeah, really impressive group of people and great to see such uh, exciting kind of uh, ideas coming out. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, um, I've done some uh, interesting uh, experiments. Uh, should I let people know about it? Um, well, um, I, uh, Christine mentioned this on the forum. I went on to mention it on Twitter. Uh, uh, to which I got this response, uh, you, uh, you're looking for a job, you may be wondering who Xavier Ameritrain is, well, 
Uh, he is the founder of a hot new medical AI startup. He was previously the head of engineering at Quora. Before that, he was the guy at Netflix who ran the data science team and built their recommender systems. Um, and so this is what happens if you do something cool, uh, but let people know about it and uh, get get noticed by um, awesome people like Xavier. Um, so uh, let's um, talk about uh, Sci-Fi 10. And the reason I'm going to talk about Sci-Fi 10 um, is that uh, we're going to be looking at some more, um, you know, bare bones PyTorch stuff today to build these generative adversarial models. There's there's no really fast AI support to speak of at all for, for GANs at the moment. I'm sure there will be soon enough, but currently there isn't. So we're going to be building a lot of models from scratch. Now it's been a while since we've done much, um, you know, serious model building. A little bit of model building, I guess, for our. Um, uh, bounding box stuff, but really all the interesting stuff there was the loss function. So we looked at Sci-Fi 10 um, in the part one of the course, and we built something which was getting about 85% accuracy and took, I can't remember, a couple of hours to train. Um, interestingly, there's a competition going on now to see who can actually train Sci-Fi 10 the fastest, going through this uh, Stanford Dawn bench. And currently, uh, so the, the goal is to get it to train to 94% accuracy. So It'd be interesting to see if we can build an architecture that can get to 94% accuracy, because that's a lot better than our previous attempt, and so hopefully in doing so we'll learn something about creating good architectures. Uh, that'll be then useful for looking at um, uh, these GANs today. Uh, but I think also it's useful because um, I've been kind of looking much more deeply into the last few years' papers about uh, uh, different kinds of CNN architectures and realized that a lot of the insights in those papers are not being widely leveraged and are clearly not widely understood. So I want to show you what happens if we can leverage some of that understanding. Uh, so I've got this um, notebook called Sci-Fi 10 Darknet. Uh, that's because the, the particular architecture we're going to look at is, is quite, is really very close to the darknet architecture. But you'll see in the process that the darknet architecture, as in not the whole YOLO version 3 end to end thing, but just the part of it that um, they pre trained on ImageNet to do classification, it's, it's almost like the most generic, simple architecture almost you could come up with. Um, and so it's a, it's a really great starting point for experiments. Uh, so we're going to call it darknet, but it's not quite darknet, and you can fiddle around with it to create things that definitely aren't darknet. It's really just the basis of nearly any um, modern ResNet-based architecture. So Sci-Fi 10, remember, uh, is a, a fairly small data set. The images are only 32 by 32 in size. Um, and I think it's a really great data set to work with because it's... Um, you can you can train it you know relatively quickly unlike ImageNet. It's a relatively small amount of data unlike ImageNet, and it's actually quite hard to recognise the images because 32 by 32 is is kind of too small to easily see what's going on. So it's it's somewhat challenging. Um, so I think it's a really um, underappreciated data set because it's old, you know. And you you know who 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 at DeepMind or OpenAI wants to work with a small old data set when they could use their entire server room to process something much bigger. But, you know, to me, I think this is a really great data set to focus on. Um, so, um, so we'll go ahead and, and kind of import our usual stuff, and we're going to try and build a, a, a network from scratch to train this with. Um, one thing that I think is a really good exercise for anybody who's not 100% confident with their kind of broadcasting and PyTorch and so forth basic skills is figure out how I came up with these numbers. Okay, So these numbers are the um, averages for each channel and the standard deviations for each channel in Sci-Fi 10. So I'll try and, um, that's a bit of a homework, just make sure you can recreate those numbers and see if you can do it in, you know, no more than a couple of lines of code, you know, no loops. Right? Uh, ideally, uh, you want to kind of do it in one go if you can. Um, all right, uh, because these are fairly small, we can use a larger batch size than usual, 256, um, and the size of these images is 32. Um, 
transformations. Um, normally, uh, we kind of have this standard set of uh, side-on transformations we use for uh, photos of normal objects. We're not going to use that here though, because these images are so small that trying to rotate a 32 by 32 image a bit is going to introduce a lot of, you know, blocky kind of distortions. Um, so the kind of standard transforms that people tend to use is a random horizontal flip, and then we add um, size divided by eight, so four pixels of padding on each side. And one thing which uh, I find works really well is by default, FastAI doesn't add black padding, which basically every other library does. We actually take the last four pixels of the existing photo and flip it and reflect it. And we find that we get much better results by using this reflection padding uh, by default. Um, so now that we've got a 36 by 36 image, um, this set of transforms in training will randomly pick a 32 by 32 crop. So we get a, a little bit of variation, but not heaps. All right, so we can use our normal from paths to grab our data. So we now need an architecture. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to create an architecture which fits in one screen. Okay, so um, this is uh, from scratch, uh, as you can see, the only, uh, you know, I, I, I'm using the predefined conf2d, batch norm2d, leaky value um, uh, modules, um, but I'm not using any blocks or anything, they're all being defined. So the entire thing is here on one screen. So if you're ever wondering, can I understand a, a modern, good quality uh, architecture? Absolutely. Let's study, let's study this one. Okay. So, my basic starting point with an architecture is to say, okay, it's, it's, it's a stacked bunch of layers. And generally speaking, there's going to be some kind of hierarchy of layers. So at the very bottom level, there's things like a convolutional layer and a batch norm layer. But generally speaking, any time you have uh, a convolution, you're probably going to have some standard sequence. And normally it's going to be conv, batch norm, then a nonlinear activation, like a ReLU. Right? So, you know, I try to start kind of right from the top by saying, okay, what are my basic units going to be? And so by defining it here, that way I don't have to worry about, um, um, I don't have to worry about kind of trying to, trying to keep everything consistent and it's going to make everything a lot simpler. So here's my conv layer. And so anytime I say conv layer, I mean conv, batch norm, ReLU. Now I'm not quite saying ReLU, I'm saying leaky ReLU. Um, and, um, that's, um, I think we've briefly mentioned it before, but the basic idea is that normally a ReLU looks like that, right? Hopefully you all know that now. Um, a leaky ReLU looks like that. Right, so this part, as before, has a gradient of 1, and this part has a gradient of, it can vary, but something around 0.1 or 0.01 is common. Right? And the idea behind it is that um, when you're in this negative zone here, you don't end up with a, a zero gradient, which makes it very hard to update it. Um, in practice, people have found leaky ReLU more useful on smaller data sets and less useful on big data sets. But it's interesting that um, for the YOLO version 3 paper, they did use a leaky ReLU and got great performance from it. Um, so it, it, it really makes things worse and it often makes things better. So it's probably not bad if you need to create your own architecture to make that your default go-to, um, uh, is to use leaky ReLU. Okay. You'll notice I don't define a, a, a PyTorch module here, I just go ahead and go sequential. This is something that if you read other people's PyTorch code, it's really underutilized. People tend to write everything as a PyTorch module with an init and a forward. But if you're, if the thing you want is just a sequence of, of things one after the other, it's much more concise and easy to understand to just make it a sequential, right? So I've just got a simple plain function that just returns a sequential model. All right, so um, I mentioned that there's generally kind of a number of hierarchies of kind of units um, in most modern networks, and I think we know now that the, 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 the kind of next level in this unit hierarchy for um, ResNets, 
and kind of this this is a type of ResNet uh, is the is the uh, the Res block or the residual block. Uh, I call it here a, a, a Res layer. Um, And back when we last did SciFAR 10, um, I, I oversimplified this, I cheated a little bit. Um, we had um, X coming in, and we put that through a conv, and then we added it back up to X to go out. Okay, so we ended up, so but in general, you know, we've got um, your output is equal to uh, your input plus some function of your input, right? And the thing we did last year was we meant we made f was a 2D conv, okay? But actually, the in the real uh, res block, there's actually two of them. Okay, so it's actually conv of conv of x. Okay, and when I say conv, I'm using this as a shortcut for our conv layer. In other words, um, uh, in other words, conv batch norm ReLU. Okay, so you can see here I've created two convs, and here it is. I take my x, put it through the first conv, put it through the second conv, and add it back up to my input again um, to get my basic res block. Okay. Um, so, one kind of uh, interesting approach, or one interesting insight here, is kind of what are the um, number of channels in these convolutions, right? So we've got coming in some ni, some number of input channels, number of inputs, or number of input filters, okay? Um, the way that the Darknet folks set things up is they said, okay, we're going to make every one of these res layers spit out the same number of channels that came in. And I kind of like that, that's why I used it here, because it makes life simpler, right? And so what they did is they said, okay, let's have the first conv halve the number of channels, and then the second conv double it again. So ni goes to ni over 2, and then ni over 2 goes to ni, right? So you've kind of got this like funneling thing, where if you've got like 64 channels coming in, it kind of gets squished down with the first conv down to 32 channels, and then taken back up again to 64 channels coming out. Uh, yes, Rachel? Why is in place equals true in the leaky ReLU? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, a lot of people forget this or don't know about it, um, but this is a really important um, um, memory technique. Um, if you think about it, this conv layer, it's like the lowest level thing. So pretty much everything in our ResNet, once it's all put together, is going to be conv layers, conv layers, conv layers. Um, if you don't have in place equals true, it's going to create a whole separate piece of memory uh, for the output of the ReLU. Um, so like it's going to allocate a whole bunch of memory that's that's totally unnecessary um, and actually Since I wrote this I come up came up with an, another idea the other day Which I'll now implement which is you could do the same thing for the um, res layer rather than going. Let's just reorder this to say um, X plus that um, you can actually do the same thing here uh, hopefully some of you might remember that in PyTorch, pretty much every function has an underscore suffix version, which says do that in place. So plus, there's also a add, and so that's add in place, and so that's now suddenly reduced my memory there as well. Um, so these are these are really handy little tricks. And I actually forgot the in place equals true at first for this, and I literally was having to decrease my batch size to much lower amounts than I knew should be possible, and it was driving me crazy, and then I realized that that was missing. Um, you can also do that with dropout, by the way, if you, if you have dropout. So uh, dropout and uh, uh, all the activation functions you can do in place, and then uh, generally any arithmetic operation you can do in place as well. 
Why is bias usually, like in ResNet, set to false in the conf layer? Um, yeah, so if you're watching the video, pause now and see if you can figure this out, right? Because this is a really interesting question. It's like, why don't we need bias? Okay, so I'll wait for you to pause. Okay, welcome back. So if you figured it out, um, here's the thing, right? Immediately after the conf is a batch norm. And remember, batch norm has two learnable parameters uh, for each activation, um, the, the, the kind of the thing you multiply by and the thing you add. Um, so since we're, um, if, we, if we had bias here to add, and then we add another thing here, we're adding two things, which is totally pointless, like that's two weights where one would do, right? So if you have a batch norm after a conv, uh, then you can, you can either say in the batch norm, don't, don't include the add bit there, please, or easier is just to say don't include the bias um, in the in the con. Okay. Um, there's no particular harm, but again, it's 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 going to take more memory because that's more gradients that it has to keep track of. Um, so best to avoid. Um, also, another thing, a little trick is um, most people's con layers have um, padding as a parameter, um, but generally speaking, you should be able to calculate the padding easily enough. Right, and I see people like try to like uh, implement, you know, special same padding modules and all kinds of stuff like that. But like, if you've got a stride one and you've got, uh, or pretty much any stride actually, um, and you've got um, padding of, th uh, sorry, and a uh, kernel size of three, right? Then obviously that's going to overlap by kind of one unit on each side. So we want padding of one. Or else if it's stride one then we don't need any padding. So in general, padding of kernel size integer divided by two um, is what you need. There's some tweaks sometimes, but in this case this works perfectly well. Um, so again, trying to simplify my code by having the computer calculate stuff for me rather than me having to do it myself. Um, another thing here with the two conf layers, so we, we kind of uh, uh, have this idea of a bottleneck, this idea of reducing the channels and then increasing them again, is also what kernel size we use. So here is a one by one conv, right? And so this is again something you might want to pause the video now and think about what's a one by one conv really? Uh, what actually happens in a one by one conv? So if we've got, you know, a little four by four grid here, Right, and of course there's a filters or channels axis as well. Maybe that's like 32. Right, and we're going to do a one by one conv. So what's the kernel for a one by one conv going to look like? It's going to be one by 32. Right. So remember when we talk about the the kernel size, we never mention that last piece. We don't say it's 1 by 1 by 32, because that's part of the, the filters in and filters out. So in other words then, what happens is this, this one thing gets placed, first of all, here on the first cell, and we basically get a dot product of that 32 deep bit with this 32 bit deep bit, and that's going to give us our first, oops, and that's going to give us our first output. Right, and then we're going to take that 32-bit bit and put it with the second one to get the second output. Right, so it's basically going to be a bunch of little dot products, okay, um, for each point in the grid. Um, so it's, what it basically is then is a um, um, it's basically something which is allowing us to 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 kind of change the dimensionality. Uh, in whatever way we want in the in the channel dimension, um, and so that would be um, that would be one of our filters, right? And so in this case, we're creating ni divided by two of these, right? So we're going to have ni divided by two of these dot products, all with different, basically different weighted averages of the input channels. Okay, so it's it basically lets us. Um, you know, with very little computation, um, add, add this additional step of calculations and nonlinearities. 
Um, so that's a that's a cool trick, you know, this idea of taking advantage of these one by one comps, creating this bottleneck, and then pulling it out again with three by three comps. So that's actually going to take advantage of the uh, you know the two D nature of the input properly. Or else a one by one comp doesn't take advantage of that at all. Um, so these two lines of code, there's not much in it, but it's a really great test of your understanding and kind of your intuition about what's going on. Why is it that a one by one con going from NI to NI over two channels, followed by a three by three con going from NI over two to NI, NI channels, like why does it work? Why do the tensor ranks line up? Why do the dimensions all line up nicely? Um, why is it a good idea? What's it really doing? Um, like it's a really good thing to fiddle, fiddle around with, maybe create some small ones in Jupyter Notebook, you know, run them yourself, see what inputs and outputs come in and out, you know, really get a feel for that. Um, once you've done so, uh, you can then play around with different things, right? And there's actually one of the um, really unappreciated papers is this one, Wide Residual Networks, right? And it's really quite a simple paper, um, but what they do is they basically fiddle around with with these two lines of code, right? And what they do is they say, well, what if this wasn't two, uh, divided by two, but what if it was times two? Like that'd be totally allowable, right? That's going to line up nicely. Uh, or what if we had another com3 after this, um, and so this was actually ni over 2 to ni over 2, and then this is ni over 2. Again, that's going to work, right? Kernel size 1, 3, 1, going to half the number of kernels, leave it at half, and then double it again at the end. And so they, they come up with this kind of simple notation for, for, for basically defining what this can look like. And then they show lots of experiments. And basically what they show is that this approach of, um, of bottlenecking, of decreasing the number of channels, which is like almost universal in ResNets, um, is probably not a good idea. In fact, from the experiments, definitely not a good idea. Because um, what happens is it lets you create really deep networks, right? And the guys who created ResNets um, got particularly famous for creating a 1001 layer network. Right? But the thing about a thousand and one layers is you can't calculate layer two until you finish layer one. And you can't calculate layer three until you finish calculating layer two. So it's sequential. GPUs don't like sequential. Um, so what they showed is that if you have less layers, but with more, acti with more uh, calculations per layer, and so one easy way to do that would be to remove the divided by two. No other changes. Right? Like, try this at home. Try running sci far and see what happens, right? Or maybe even multiply it by two, or fiddle around. And um, that basically lets your GPU do more work. And it's very interesting because the vast majority of papers that talk about um, performance of different architectures never actually time how long it takes to run a batch through it. Like they literally say this one requires X number of floating point operations per batch. But then they never actually bother to run the damn thing like a proper experimentalist and find out whether it's faster or slower. And so a lot of the architectures that are really famous now turn out to be slow as molasses and take crap loads of memory and just are totally useless because the, um, the, the researchers never actually bothered to see whether they're fast and to actually see whether they fit in RAM with normal size batch, batch sizes. So the wide ResNet paper is unusual in that it actually times how long it takes, as does the YOLO version 3 paper, uh, which, which made the same insight. I'm not sure they might have missed the wide ResNets paper because the, the uh, YOLO version 3 paper came to a lot of the same conclusions, um, but I, I, I'm not even sure they cited the wide ResNets paper, so they might not be aware that all that work's been done. Um, but they're both, uh, both great to see people actually timing things and noticing what actually makes sense. Yes, Rich? Cellu looked really hot in the paper which came out, but I noticed that you don't use it. What's your opinion on Cellu? Uh, so Cellu is um, 
something largely for fully connected layers which allows you to get rid of batch norm. And the basic idea is that if you use this different activation function, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, self-normalizing. That's what the S in cell use stands for. Um, so self-normalizing means it'll, it'll always remain at a unit standard deviation and zero mean, and therefore you don't need that batch norm. Um, it hasn't really gone anywhere, um, and the reason it hasn't really gone anywhere is because it's incredibly finicky. Um, you have to use a very specific initialization, otherwise it doesn't start at exactly the right um, standard deviation of mean. Um, very hard to use it with things like embeddings. Uh, if you do, then you have to use it a particular kind of embedding. Initialization, which doesn't necessarily actually make sense for embeddings. Um, so, you know, and you do all this work, um, very hard to get it right, and if you do finally get it right, what's the point? Well, you've managed to get rid of some batch norm layers, which weren't really hurting you anyway. Um, and it's interesting, because that paper, that cellular paper, I think one of the reasons people noticed it, or in my experience, the main reason people noticed it was because it was created by the inventor of LSTMs. Um, and also it had a huge mathematical appendix, and people were like, oh, lots of maths from a famous guy, this must be great, you know. Um, but in practice, I don't see anybody using it uh, to get any state-of-the-art results or win any competitions or anything like that. Um. Okay, so this is like some of the tiniest bits of code we've seen, but there's so much here and it's fascinating to play with. Um, so now we've got this block which is built on this block, and then we're going to create another block on top of that block. Okay, so um, we're going to call this a group layer, uh, and it's going to create a it's going to contain a bunch of res layers. Um, and so a group layer um, is going to have some number of channels or filters coming in. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to double the number of channels coming in by just using a standard conv layer. Um, optionally, we'll halve the grid size by using a stride of two. Okay. And then we're going to do a whole bunch of res blocks, a whole bunch of res layers. We can pick how many. Uh, it could be two or three or eight. Right? Because remember, these res layers don't change the grid size and they don't change the number of channels. So you can add as many as you like, anywhere you like, without causing any problems. Um, it's just going to use more computation and uh, more RAM, um, but there's no reason other than that you can't add as many as you like. So a group layer, therefore, uh, is going to end up um, doubling the number of channels because of this initial convolution, which doubles the number of channels. Um, Easy. This initial convolution doubles the number of channels, and depending on what we pass in a stride, it may also halve the grid size if we put stride equals two. Um, and then we can do a whole bunch of res block computations, as many as we like. All right. So then, to define our um, our dark net or whatever we want to call this thing, um, we're just going to pass in something that looks like this. And what this says is create five group layers. The first one will contain one of these extra res layers, the second will contain two, then four, then six, then three. And I want you to start with 32 filters. Uh, that should be NF, I'll start at F. Right. So the first um, one of these uh, res, uh, res layers will contain 32 filters, um, and there'll just be one extra res layer. Uh, the second one, uh, it's going to double the number of filters, because that's what we do each time we have a new group layer, we double the number. So the second one will have 64, and then 128, then 256, and then 512, and then that'll be it. Right? So that's going to be like nearly all of the network is going to be those bunches of layers. And remember, every one of those group layers also has one convolution at the start. Okay, um, And so then all we have is, before that all happens, we're going to have one convolutional layer at the very start, uh, and at the very end we're going to do our standard adaptive average pooling, flatten, and a linear layer to create the number of classes out at the end. Right? So one convolution at the end, uh, adaptive pooling, and one linear layer uh, at the other end, and then in the middle, these 
group layers, each one consisting of a convolutional layer followed by n number of res layers. Um, and that's, that's it. Um, again, I think we've mentioned this a few times, but I'm yet to see uh, any code out there, any, um, any examples, uh, anything anywhere that uses adaptive average pooling. Everyone I've seen writes it like this, and then spits a particular number here, right? which means that it's now tied to a particular image size, which definitely isn't what you want. So most people, even the top researchers I speak to, most of them are still under the impression that um, a specific architecture is tied to a specific size. Um, and that's a, a, a huge problem when people think that because it really limits their ability to like use smaller sizes to kind of kickstart their modeling or to use smaller sizes for doing experiments and stuff like that. Um, again, you'll notice I'm using sequential here, right? And a nice way to create architectures is to start out by creating a list. In this case, this is a list with just one conv layer in. And then my function here, make group layer, it just returns another list. Right, so then I can just go plus equals app appending that list to the previous list and then I could go plus equals to append this bunch of things to that list and then finally sequential of all those layers. Right, so that's a very nice thing. So now my forward is just self.layers. Okay, so here's a kind of, you know, this is a nice kind of picture of how to make your architectures as simple as possible. Okay, so you can now go ahead and create this and as I say, you can fiddle around, you know, you could even parameterize this two to make it a number that you kind of pass in here to pass in different numbers. So it's not two, maybe it's times two instead. You could pass in things that change the kernel size or change the number of convolutional layers, you know, fiddle around with it. And maybe you can create something. I've actually got uh, a version of this, which um, I'm about to run for you, which um, kind of implements all of the different parameters that's in that wide ResNet paper. Um, so I could fiddle around uh, to see what worked well. So once we've got that, um, we can use ConvLearner from model data to take our PyTorch model module and the da model data object and turn them into a learner, give it a criterion, that's a metrics if we like, and then we can call fit and away we go. Could you please explain adaptive average pooling? How does setting to one work? Uh, sure. Um, before I do, um, I just want to, like, since we've only got a certain amount of time in this class, um, I wanted to see, uh, I do want to see how we go, um, you know, uh, with this simple network against these state-of-the-art results. Um, so to make life a little easier, so we can, we can start it running now and see how it looks later. So I've got the uh, command ready to go. Um, so we've basically ta taken all that stuff and put it into a simple little Python script. Um, and I've modified some of those parameters I mentioned uh, to create something I've called a WRN22 network, which doesn't officially exist, but it's got a bunch of changes to the parameters we talked about based on my experiments. We're going to use um, the uh, new Leslie Smith one cycle uh, thing. So there's quite a bunch of uh, cool stuff here. So the one cycle implementation was done by our student Silver Guga, uh, I think. I don't know how to pronounce his name exactly. Silver. Um, uh, this uh, the train sci-fi experiments uh, were largely done by Brett Kearns, and uh, stuff like getting the uh, half precision floating point implementation uh, integrated into Fast AI uh, was done by um, Andrew Shaw. Um, so it's been a, a cool uh, kind of bunch of different student projects coming together to allow us to run this. Um, so this is going to run actually on a uh, AWS, Amazon AWS P3, uh, which has uh, eight GPUs. Uh, the P3 has uh, these newer Volta architecture GPUs, which actually have special support for half precision floating point. Um, FastAI is the first library uh, I know of to actually integrate uh, the Volta optimized half precision floating point into the library. So we can just go learn.half now uh, and get that support automatically. Um, and it's also the first one to integrate uh, one cycle. Uh, so these are the parameters for the one cycle. Um, uh, so we can go ahead and get this running. So what this actually does is it's using um, PyTorch's uh, multi-GPU support. Um, since there are eight GPUs, it's actually going to fire off eight separate Python processes, and each one's going to train on a little bit, and then at the end it's going to um, pass 
the gradient updates back to kind of the master process that's going to integrate them uh, all together. So you'll see, um, here they are, right? So lots of progress bars all pop up together. And you can see it's training, you know, three or four seconds uh, when you do it this way. Where else, when I had, um, uh, where else, when I was training earlier, I was getting, let's see, 30 epochs in, I was getting about 30 seconds per epoch. So doing it this way, we can kind of train things like 10 times faster or so, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay, so we'll leave that running. Um, so you were asking about adaptive average pooling, and I think specifically is what's the number one doing? So um, normally uh, when we're doing average pooling, let's say we've got four by four, let's say we did um, average pooling two comma two, right? Um, then that creates a two by two area and takes the average of those four, right? And then we can pass in the stride, right? So if we said stride one, then the next one is we'd look at this block of two by two and take that average and so forth, right? So that's like what a normal two by two average pooling would be. Um, and so that would, in that case, uh, if we didn't have any padding, uh, that would spit out a three by three, okay? Because it's two here, two here, two here. Okay, and if we added padding, we can make it three by three as well. Uh, sorry, four by four. Um, so if we wanted to spit out something, we didn't want three by three, what if we wanted one by one? Right, then we could say average pool four comma four, right? And so that's going to do four comma four and average the whole lot. Right, and that would spit out one by one. Um, but that's just one way to do it. Um, rather than saying the size of the, uh, the, the kind of the pooling filter, um, why don't we instead say, well, I don't care what the size of the input grid is, I always want one by one. Right, so that's where then you say adaptive average pool. And now you don't say what's the size of the pooling filter, you instead say what's the size of the output I want. And so I want something that's sort of one by one. And if you only put a single int, it assumes you mean one by one. So in this case, adaptive average pooling one with a four by four grid coming in uh, is the same as average pooling four comma four. If it was a seven by seven grid coming in, it would be the same as seven comma seven. Right? So it's the same operation, it's just expressing it in a way that says, regardless of the input, I want something of that sized output. Please. Okay. How's our little thing going along? Oh, okay. Uh, well, we got to 94, and it took 3 minutes and 11 seconds, and the previous state of the art was 1 hour and 7 minutes. So was it worth fiddling around with those parameters and learning a little bit about how these architectures actually work and not just using what came out of the box? Well, holy shit, we just used a publicly available instance. We used a spot instance, so it's costing, so that cost us so like eight dollars per hour for three minutes. It cost us a few cents to train this from scratch, twenty times faster than anybody's ever done it before. So that's like the most crazy state-of-the-art result I think we've ever seen. <laughs> we've seen many, um, but this one just blew it out of the water, right? And so, um, you know, uh, this is kind of uh, partly thanks to just fiddling around with those parameters of the architecture, um, mainly, frankly, about uh, using um, Leslie Smith's one cycle thing and Silva's implementation of that. And remember, not only, um, so just a reminder of what that's doing, it's basically saying, um, this is um, batches, right? And this is learning rate, right? Um, it creates uh, an upward path that's equally long as the downward path, 
right? So it's a true CLR triangular cyclical learning rate. Um, as per usual, you can pick the ratio between those two numbers, right? So x divided by y in this case is is a number that you get to pick. In this case, we we picked fifty. Okay, so we started out with a much smaller one here. Um, and then it's got this cool idea, which is you get to say what percentage of your epochs then is spent going from the bottom of this down all the way down pretty much to zero. And that's what this second number here is. So 15% of the batches are spent going from um, uh, the bottom of our triangle even further. Uh, so importantly though, that's not the only thing one cycle does. We also have momentum. Right, and momentum goes from 0.95 to 0.85, like this. Um, in other words, when the um, learning rate's really low, we use a lot of momentum, and when the learning rate's really high, we use very little momentum, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but until Leslie Smith showed this in that paper, I've never seen anybody do it before. Um, so it's a really, really cool trick. So um, you can now use that uh, by using the use CLR beta parameter um, in in fast AI, uh, and you should be able to basically replicate this state of the art result. Um, you can use it on your own uh, computer or your paper space. Obviously, the only thing you won't get is the multi GPU um, piece, but that makes it a bit easier to train anyway. So on a single GPU, uh, you should be able to beat this. Um, uh, this this on a single GPU. Yeah. Make group layer contains stride equals two. So this means stride is one for layer one and two for everything else. What's the logic behind it? Usually the strides I have seen are odd. No, strides are either one or two. I think you're thinking of kernel sizes. So stride equals two means that I jump two across. And so a stride of two means that you have your grid size. Um, so I think you might have just got confused between stride and kernel size there. And so um, if we have a stride of 1, the grid size doesn't change. If we have a stride of 2, then it does. And so in this case, because this is for SciFar 10, uh, 32 by 32 is small, and we don't get to halve the grid size very often, right? Because pretty quickly we're going to run out of cells. And so that's why um, uh, the first layer has a stride of one, so we don't decrease uh, the grid size straight away, basically. Um, and it's kind of a nice way of doing it because that's why we kind of have a, a low number here, so we can we can start out um, with you know not too much computation on the big grid, and then we can gradually do more and more computation as the grids get smaller and smaller, right? Because the smaller grid the computation will take um, less time. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think uh, so that we can do all of our GANing in one go, let's take a slightly early break and come back at um, 7.30. Um, so we're going to talk about generative adversarial networks, also known as GANs, and specifically we're going to focus on the uh, Wasserstein GAN paper, uh, which included some guy called Sumith Chintala who went on to create some piece of software called PyTorch. Uh, the Wasserstein GAN was heavily influenced by the uh, so I'm just going to call this W GAN most of the time, the DC GAN or Deep Convolution ge Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks paper, which also Sumith was involved with. Um, so uh, it's a really interesting paper to read. Um, a lot of it looks like this. Um, the good news is you can skip those bits. Because there's also a bit that looks like this, which says, do these things. Right? Now, um, 
I will say though that like a lot of papers have a theoretical section which seems to be there entirely to get past the reviewers need for theory that's not true with the WGAN paper. The theory bit is actually really interesting. Like you don't need to know it to use it, but if you want to um, learn about like some some cool ideas and see the thinking behind why this particular algorithm, it's it's absolutely fascinating. And almost nobody before this paper came out, I didn't know literally. I knew nobody who had studied the math that it's based on. Um, so like everybody. Had to learn the math it was based on, and, and so the paper does a pretty good job of laying out all the pieces. You'll have to do a bunch of reading yourself. So, um, if you're interested, like in digging into the deeper math behind some paper to see what it's like to study it, I would pick this one um, because at the end of that theory section, you'll come away saying like, "Okay, I, I can see now why they made this algorithm." The way it is, right? And then having come up with that idea, like the other thing is, often these theoretical sections are very clearly added after they come up with the algorithm. They'll come up with the algorithm based on intuition and experiments, and then later on, post hoc justify it. Whereas this one, you can clearly see it's like, okay, let's actually think about what's going on in GANs and think about what they need to do, and then come up with the algorithm. So the basic um, idea of a of a GAN. Is it's a generative model, okay? So it's something that is going to create sentences or create images. It's going to generate stuff, right? And um, it's going to try and create stuff, which is very hard to tell the difference between generated stuff and real stuff. Right? So a generative model could be used to face swap a video, you know, a very well known. Uh, controversial thing of deep fakes and fake pornography and stuff happening at the moment uh, could be used to fake um, uh, somebody's voice. Uh, it could be used to fake uh, the answer to a medical question. But in that case, it's not really a fake, right? It could be a generative answer to a medical question that's actually a good answer, right? So you're like generating language. You could generate a caption uh, to a um, to an image, for example. Um, so generative models have lots of app interesting applications, um, but uh, generally speaking, they they need to be good enough that, for example, if you're using it to you know uh, automatically create a new scene for Carrie Fisher in the next Star Wars movies and she's not around to play that part anymore, you want to you know try and generate an image of her that looks the same. Then it has to fool the Star Wars audience into thinking like, okay, that that doesn't look like some weird Carrie Fisher. That looks like the real Carrie Fisher. Um, or if you're trying to generate an answer to a medical question, you want to generate English that reads, you know, nicely and clearly and sounds um, authoritative and meaningful. So the idea of a generative adversarial network is we're going to create not just a generative model to create. Say the, the 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 generated image, but a second model that's going to try to pick which ones are real and which ones are generated, and we're going to call them fake, right? Uh, so which ones are real and which ones are fake? So we've got a generator that's going to create our fake content, and a discriminator that's going to try to get good at recognizing which ones are real and which ones are fake. So there's going to be two models. And then they're going to be adversarial, meaning the generator is going to try to trying to keep getting better at fooling the discriminator into thinking that fake is real, and the discriminator is going to try to keep getting better at discriminating between the real and the fake, and they're going to go head to head like that, right? And it's basically as easy as I just described. It really is. We're just going to build two models in PyTorch. We're going to create a training loop that first of all says. The loss function for the discriminator is can you tell the difference between real and fake, and then update the weights of that. And then we're going to create a loss function for the generator, which is going to say can you generate something which falls the discriminator, and update the weights from from that loss. And we're going to loop through that a few times and see what happens. And so let's come back to the pseudocode here of the algorithm and let's read the real code first. 
So there's lots of different things you can do with um, GANs, um, and we're going to do something that's kind of boring but easy to understand, and uh, and uh, it's kind of cool that it's even possible. Which is we're just going to generate some pictures from nothing. We're just going to get it to draw some pictures. Okay, and specifically we're going to get it to draw pictures of bedrooms. Right? Um, you'll find if you um, hopefully get a chance to play around with this during the week with your own data sets. If you pick a data set that's very varied, like ImageNet, and then get a, a GAN to try and create ImageNet pictures, it tends not to do so well, because it's it's not really clear enough what do you want a picture of, right? So it's better to give it, uh, for example, the um, there's a data set called Celeb A, which is pictures of celebrities' faces. That works great with GANs. You create really clear celebrity faces that don't actually exist. Um, the bedroom data set, also a good one, right? Lots of things, pictures of the same kind of thing. Okay, so that's just a suggestion. So there's something called the uh, L Sun Scene Classification data set. Um, you can download it using um, these steps. Um, I've also, um, it's pretty huge, um, so I've actually created a Kaggle data set uh, of a 20% sample. Right, so unless you're really excited about generating bedroom images, you might prefer to grab the 20% sample. Um, so then we do the normal steps of creating some different paths. Um, and in this case, you know, I, as we do before, I find it much easier to kind of go the CSV route when it comes to handling our, our data. So I just generate a CSV uh, with the list of files that we want and a, a fake label of zero, because we don't really have labels for these at all. Um, and I actually create two, par, uh, two CSV files, um, one that contains uh, everything in that bedroom data set, and one that just contains a random 10%. And it's just nice to do that, because then I can most of the time use the sample um, when I'm experimenting, because um, like because there's well over a million files, even just reading in the list takes a while. Right? Um, so this will look pretty familiar. Um, so here's a conf block. This is before I uh, realized that sequential models are much better. So if you compare this to my previous conf block with a sequential model, there's just a lot more lines of code here. Um, but you know, uh, it does the same thing of doing conv value batch norm. Okay, um, and uh, we calculate our padding, and here's a bias false. So this is the same as before, basically, but with a little bit more code. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a discriminator. So a discriminator is going to receive as input um, an image, okay? and it's going to spit out a number. And the number is meant to be lower uh, if it thinks this image is real. Okay. Now, of course, the what does it do for a lower number thing doesn't appear in the architecture. That'll be in the loss function. So all we have to do is create something that takes an image and spits out a number. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of this code is uh, borrowed from the um, original um, uh, authors of this paper of the paper. Um, so some of the uh, Naming scheme and stuff is different to what we're used to, so sorry about that. Um, but hopefully, I've, I've tried to make it look at least somewhat familiar. I probably should have renamed things a little bit. Um, but it looks very similar to actually what we had before. We start out with a, uh, a convolution. So remember, conv block is conv value batch norm. Okay. Um, and then we have a bunch of extra conv layers. This is not going to use a residual. Right, so it looks very similar to before, a bunch of extra layers, but these are going to be conv layers rather than res layers. Um, and then uh, at the end, uh, we need to append enough stride 2, um, enough stride 2 conv layers that we decrease the size, the grid size, down to be um, no bigger than 4x4. Four four. Right, so it's going to keep using stride 2 divide the size by 2, stride 2, divide by the size by 2, until our grid size is no bigger than 4. And so this is quite a nice way of like creating as many layers as you need in a network to handle arbitrary sized images and turn them into a fixed known grid size. Yes, Rachel? Um, 
does a GAN need a lot more data than, say, dogs versus cats or NLP, or is it comparable? Um, you know, honestly, um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I am not an expert practitioner in GANs. Uh, so, you know, um, the stuff I teach in part one is stuff I'm happy to say I know the best way to, you know, pretty close to the best way to do these things, and so I can show you state-of-the-art results like I just did with SciFAR 10. Uh, with the help of some of my students, of course. Um, I'm not there at all with GANs. Um, so I'm not quite sure how much you need. Like, in general, it seems you need quite a lot. Um, but remember, the only reason we didn't need too much in dogs and cats is because we had a pre-trained model, and could we leverage pre-trained GAN models and fine-tune them? Probably. Uh, I don't think anybody's done it, as far as I know. Um, that could be a really interesting thing for people to kind of think about and experiment with. Uh, maybe people have done it, and there's some literature there I haven't come across. So I'm somewhat familiar with the main pieces of literature in GANs, but I don't know all of it. Um, so maybe I've missed something about transfer learning in GANs. Uh, but that would be the trick to not needing too much data. Um, so it's the huge speed up. A combination of one cycle learning rate and momentum annealing plus the eight GPU parallel training and the half precision. Is that only possible to do the half precision calculation with consumer GPU? Another question, why is the calculation eight times faster from single to half precision while from double to single is only two times faster? Okay, so the SciFAR 10 result, it's not eight times faster from single to half. Um, it's about two or three times as fast from single to half. Um, the the NVIDIA claims about the about the flops performance of the tensor cores are academically correct, but in practice meaningless um, because it really depends on what cores you need for what pieces. So about two or three x improvement per half. Um, so yeah, the half precision helps a bit. Um, the um, the extra GPUs helps a bit. The one cycle helps an enormous amount. But then another key piece was the playing around with the parameters that I told you about. So kind of t reading the wide ResNet paper carefully, identifying the kinds of things that they found there, uh, and then writing a version of the um, architecture you just saw that made it really easy for me to fiddle around with, well not just for me, for, for Brett Coons to fiddle around with parameters. Uh, Staying up all night trying every possible combination of, of different kernel sizes and numbers of kernels and numbers of layer groups and size of layer groups and um, the amount of uh, remember we did a, a bottleneck um, but actually we tended to focus not on bottlenecks but on instead on widening so we actually like things that increase the size and then decrease it because it takes better advantage of the GPU so. The, all, all those things uh, combined together. I'd say the one cycle was perhaps the most um, critical, um, but, but every one of those re resulted in a big speed up. That's why we were able to get this 30x improvement uh, over the state of the art SciFAR 10. Um, and we got some ideas for other things, like uh, after this dawn bench finishes, and um, you know. Maybe we'll try and go even further, see if we can beat one minute one day. That'll be fun. Um, okay. So so here's okay. So here's our discriminator, right? I mean, the, the important thing to remember about um, an architecture is it doesn't do anything other than have some input tensor size and rank and some output tensor size and rank. So this is going to spit out. You see, the last conv here has one channel. Right? This is a bit different to what we're used to, right? Because normally our last thing is a linear block, right? But our last thing here is a com block, right? And it's only got one channel, but it's got a grid size of something around 4x4. It's no more than 4x4. Four four. So we're going to spit out a, let's say it's 4x4, four four, a 4x4x1 four four tensor. So what we then do is we then take the mean of that. Right, so it goes from four by four by one to a scalar. Right, so this is kind of like the ultimate adaptive average pooling. Right, because we've got something with just one channel, we take the mean. So this is a bit, um, yeah, a bit different. Normally we first do average pooling and then we put it through uh, a fully connected layer to get our one thing out. In this case, though, we're getting one channel out and then taking the mean of, of that. Um, 
I haven't fiddled around with like why did we do it that way? What would instead happen if we did the usual average pooling followed by uh, a fully connected layer? Would it work better? Would it not? I I don't know. Um, I rather suspect it would work better if we did it like the normal way, um, but I haven't tried it, and I don't really have a good enough intuition to know whether I'm missing something. Be an interesting experiment to try. If somebody wants to stick an adaptive average pooling layer here and a fully connected layer afterwards with a single output, um, it should keep working. You know, it should do something. Um, the loss will go down um, to see whether it works. Okay, so that's the discriminator, right? So there's going to be a training loop. Um, let's let's assume we've already got a generator. Somebody says, "Okay, Jeremy, here's a generator. It generates bedrooms. Okay, I want you to build a model that can figure out which ones are real and which ones aren't." So I'm going to take the data set and I'm going to basically label uh, a bunch of images which are fake bedrooms from the generator and a bunch of images of real bedrooms from my LSUN data set uh, to stick a one or a zero on each one and then I'll try to get the discriminator to tell the difference. Okay, so that's going to be simple enough. Um, but I haven't been given a generator, I need to build one. So a generator and we haven't talked about the loss function yet, okay? We're just going to assume that there's some loss function that does this thing, okay? So a generator is also an architecture which doesn't do anything by itself until we have a loss function and data. Um, but what are the ranks and sizes of the tensors? Well, the input to the generator is going to be a vector of random numbers, okay? And uh, in the paper they call that the prior, right? It's going to be a vector of random numbers. How big? I don't know, some big, 64, 128, right? And the idea is that a different bunch of random numbers will generate a different bedroom. Okay, so that's the idea. So our, um, our GAN, uh, our generator, sorry, has to take as input um, a vector, um, and it's going to take that vector, so here's our input, right? And it's going to stick it through, in this case, a sequential model, um, and the sequential model is going to take that vector and it's going to turn it into um, a uh, two by two, sorry, a, uh, a uh, turn it into a well, a rank four tensor. Or if we take off the batch bit, a rank three tensor, height by width by uh, three. Okay. So you can see at the end here uh, our final step. Um, uh, here, NC number of channels. So I think that's going to have to end up being three because we're going to create a three channel uh, image um, of some size. Yes, Rachel. In conf block forward, is there a reason why batch norm comes after ReLU, i.e., self.batchnorm.self.relu? No, there's not. Um, it's just what they had in the code I borrowed from, I think. In, in ResNet, the order is reversed. Yeah. So um, again, unless my intuition about GANs is all wrong and they some, for some reason need to be different to what I'm used to, I would normally expect to, um, yeah, I would actually, no, sorry, I would normally expect to go ReLU then batch norm. Um, that this, this is actually the order that makes more sense to me. Um, but I think the order I had in the darknet was what they used in the darknet paper. Um, so, I don't know, everybody seems to have a different <laughs> order of these things. Um, and in fact, um, most people for Sci-Fi 10 have a different order again, which is they actually go um, BN, then ReLU, then Conv, which is kind of a quirky way of thinking about it, but it turns out that for um, often for residual blocks that works better. That's called a pre-activation ResNet. So if you Google for pre-activation ResNet, you can see that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few, not so much papers, but more blog posts out there where people have experimented with different orders of those things. And yeah, it seems to depend a lot on what specific data set it is and what you're doing it with. Uh, although in general, the difference in performance is small enough you won't care unless it's through a competition. Uh, okay, so the generator needs to start with a vector and end up with a rank 3 tensor. Um, we don't really know how to do that 
yet. So how do we do that? How do we start with a vector and turn it into a rank 3 tensor? Um, we need to use something called a deconvolution. And a deconvolution is, um, or as they call it in PyTorch, a transposed convolution. Um, uh, same name, uh, sorry, same, same thing, different name. Um, and so a deconvolution is something which, rather than decreasing the grid size, it increases the grid size. Um, so as with all things, um, it's easiest to see in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so here's a convolution, right? We start, let's say, with a 4x4 grid cell, okay, with a single channel, a single filter. Right? Uh, and let's put it through a 3x3 kernel, again, with a single output filter. Okay, So we've got a, a single channel in, a single filter kernel, and so if we don't add any padding, we're going to end up with 2x2, two two, right? Because that 3x3 three three can go in one, two, three, four places, right? can go in one of two places across and one of two places down if there's no padding. Okay, so there's our, there's our convolution, right? Remember, the convolution is just the sum of the product of the kernel and the appropriate grid cell. So there's our, there's our standard three by three con one channel, one filter. So the idea now is I want to go the opposite direction. I want to start with my 2x2, two two, and I want to create a 4x4. Four four. And specifically, I want to create the same 4x4 four four that I started with. And I want to do that by using a convolution. So how would I do that? Well, if I have a 3x3 three three convolution, then if I want to create a 4x4 four four output, I'm going to need to create this much padding, right? Because with this much padding, I'm going to end up with 1, 2, 3, 4 by 1, 2, 3, 4. You see why that is? So this filter can go in any one of four places across and four places up and down. So let's say my convolutional filter was just a bunch of zeros, then I can calculate my, my error uh, for each cell just by taking the subtraction, and then I can get the uh, sum of absolute values, the L1 loss, by just summing up the absolute values of those errors. Right? So now I could use um, optimization, uh, so uh, in um, uh, Excel that's called Solver, uh, to do a gradient descent. Okay, so I'm going to set that cell equal to a minimum, I'm going to try and reduce my loss, by changing my filter, okay, and I'll go solve, okay, and you can see it's come up with a filter such that, you know, 15.7 compared to 16, 17 is right, 17.8, 19.8, so it's not perfect, right, and in general you can't assume that a deconvolution can exactly create the same, you know, the exact thing that you want, um, because there's just not enough, you know, there's only nine things here and there's 16 things you're trying to create. Right? But it's it's made a pretty good attempt. Okay, so this is what a deconvolution looks like—a stride one, uh, three by three de deconvolution on a two by two grid cell input. Did you have a question, Adrian? How difficult is it to create a discriminator to identify fake news versus real news? Well, uh, you don't need anything special. That's just a classifier. Right, so you would just use the NLP classifier from our previous uh, previous to previous class and uh, lesson four. Right, uh, it, it's, there's not like in in that case, there's no generative piece. Right, so you just need uh, the data set that says these are the things that we believe are fake news and these are the things we consider to be real news, um, and it, it should actually work very well. You know, like as uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, if you if you try it, you should get a, a you know um, as good a result as anybody else has got. Whether it's good enough to be useful in practice, I don't know. Oh, I was to say that it's very hard um, using the technique you've described. Very hard. Well, in that, like, I mean, there's not a a good solution that does that. Well, but 
I don't think anybody in our course has tried, and nobody else outside our course knows of this technique, right? So, uh, like, there's been as we've as we've learned, we've just had a very significant jump in NLP classification capabilities, um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's it, obviously the best you could do. I think at this stage would be to generate a, a kind of a triage that says these things look pretty sketchy based on how they're written, and then, you know, some human could go in and fact check them. You know, I mean, a, an, an NLP classifier, an RNN can't fact check things, but it could recognize, like, oh, these these are written in that kind of, uh, you know, uh, that kind of highly popularized style, which often fake news is written in, and so maybe these ones are worth paying attention to. Um, I think that would probably be the best you could hope for. Uh, without drawing on some kind of external data sources. Um, yeah, but it's important to remember, you know, um, a discriminator is basically just a classifier and you don't need any special techniques beyond what we've already learnt to do NLP classification. Um, okay, so to uh, to do that kind of deconvolution in, um, in PyTorch, you just say com transport is 2D, and in the normal way you say the number of Input channels, the number of output channels, the kernel size, the stride, the padding, the bias. So these parameters are all the same, right? And the reason it's called a conv transpose is because actually it turns out that this is this is the same as the calculation of the gradient of convolution, right? So uh, that's that's basically why they call it that. Um, so this is a really nice uh, example back on the old uh, Theano website that comes from a really nice paper. Um, which actually shows you some visualizations. So this is actually the one we just saw um, of doing a 2x2 two two deconvolution. If there's a stride 2, then you don't just have padding around the outside, but you actually have to put padding in the middle as well. Right? Um, they're not actually quite implemented this way, because this is slow to do um, in practice. You, they implement them a different way, but it, it all happens behind the scenes. We don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, this, uh, we've, we've talked about this convolution arithmetic tutorial before, and if you're still not comfortable with convolutions, and in order to get comfortable with deconvolutions, this is a great uh, site to go to. If you want to see the paper, just Google for convolution arithmetic. It'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, let's do it now so you know you've found it. Here it is. And so that Theano tutorial actually comes from this paper. But the paper doesn't have the um, animated GIFs. So. Uh, okay, so it's interesting then, a deconf block looks identical to a conf block, except it's got the word transpose written here. Okay, we just go conf really batch norm as before, it's got input filters, output filters. The only difference is that stride 2 means that the uh, grid size will double rather than half. Both nnconf transpose 2D and nn.upsample seem to do the same thing, i.e. expand grid size, height, and width from the previous layer. Can we say that conf transpose 2D is always better than upsample since upsample is merely resizing and filling unknown unknowns by zeros or interpolation? No, you can't. Um, so there's a fantastic um, uh, uh, interactive paper on distill.pub called Deconvolution and Checkerboard Artifacts, which points out that um, what we're doing right now is extremely suboptimal, um, but the good news is everybody else does it. Um, if you have a look here, could you see these checkerboard artifacts? Like it, it's all like dark blue, light blue, dark blue, light blue. You know, you kind of, and so these are all from um, from actual papers, right? And uh, basically, they noticed every one of these papers with generative models has these checkerboard artifacts. And what they realized is is it's because when you have a stride two convolution of size three kernel, they overlap, right? And so you basically get like some pixels get twice as much kind of active some. Uh, grid cells, I guess, get twice as much activation. And so even if you um, start with random 
weights, you end up with a checkerboard artifact. Um, so you can kind of see it here, right? Um, and so uh, the deeper you get, uh, kind of the worse it gets. Um, their advice is actually less direct than it ought to be. Um, I found that for most generative models, upsampling is better, right? So all um, if you do nn dot upsample, then all it does is it's um, it's basically doing pooling, right? It basically, uh, but it's kind of it's kind of the opposite of pooling, right? It says let's replace this one pixel or this one grid cell with four two by two. And uh, there's a number of ways to upsample. One is just to, to, to kind of copy it across to those four. Another is to use a kind of bilinear or bicubic interpolation. There are various techniques to kind of try and create a smooth upsampled version. And you can pretty much choose any of them in PyTorch. Um, so if you do a, a, an ups, a two by two upsample and then a, a regular stride one three by three conv, that's like another way of doing uh, the same kind of thing as a, a conv transpose, right? It, it's, it's doubling the grid size and doing some uh, convolutional arithmetic on it. Um, and I found for generative models, um, it pretty much always works better. And in that distilled or pub publication, they kind of indicate that maybe that's a good approach, but they don't just come out and say, just do this, whereas I would just say, just do this. Um, Having said that, uh, for GANs, I haven't had that much success with it yet, um, and I think it probably requires some tweaking to get it to work. I, I'm sure some people have got it to work. Um, uh, the, the, the issue, I think, is that in the early stages, um, it doesn't create enough um, noise. Um, I had... No, I don't have it here. I had a version, actually, where I tried to do it with, with an upsample, and you could kind of see that the noise didn't look very noisy. Um, so anyway, it's an interesting question. But um, next week when we look at style transfer and super resolution and stuff, um, I think you'll see an end up upsample um, really comes into its own. Okay, so the generator, we can now basically start with the vector. We can decide and say like, okay, let's not think of it as a vector, but actually it's a one by one grid cell, and then we can turn it into a four by four and an eight by eight and so forth. And so uh, that's why we have to make sure it's a, a, it's a suitable multiple um, so that we can actually create something of the right size. And so you can see it's, it's doing the exact opposite as before, right? It's making the cell size smaller and smaller by two at a time. Um, as long as it can, um, um, sorry, bigger and bigger, I'm sorry, the cell size bigger and bigger as long as it can uh, until it gets to half the size that we want. Uh, and then finally we add one more on at the end, uh, sorry, we add n more on at the end of just um, uh, uh, with no stride. Uh, and then we add one more conv transpose to finally get to the uh, size that we wanted. Um, and we're done. Uh, finally, we put that through a than, um, and that's going to uh, force us to be in the zero to one range, uh, because of course we don't want to spit out arbitrary size uh, pixel values. Okay, so that's uh, so we've got a generator architecture which spits out um, an image of some given size with the correct number, with the correct whatever we asked for, correct number of channels. Um, um, and with uh, values between 0 and 1. So at this point we can now um, uh, create our model data object. Um, these things take a while to train, so um, I just made it 128 by 128, so this is just a convenient way to make it a bit faster. Um, and uh, that's going to be the size of the input, but then we're going to use transformations to turn it into 64 by 64. Okay. Um, there's been more recent advances which have attempted to really increase this up to kind of like high resolution sizes, but they still tend to require either like a batch size of one or like lots and lots of GPUs or whatever. So um, we're kind of trying to do things that we can do on cons single consumer GPUs here. Um, so here's an example of one of the 64 by 64 bedrooms. Um, okay. So um, we're going to do pretty much everything manually, so let's go ahead and create our two models, our generator and our um, discriminator. 
and as you can see their DC GAN, so in other words they're the same um, modules that came up were appeared in this paper. So if you're interested in reading the papers, um, you, it's well worth going back and looking at the DC GAN paper to see what these architectures are, because it's assumed that when you read the Wasserstein GAN paper that you already know that. Yes? Shouldn't we use a sigmoid if we want values between 0 and 1? Um, I always forget which one's which. Okay, so, sig yeah, so sigmoid is 0 to 1, than is 1 to minus 1. Um, I think what will happen is... I'm going to have to check that. I, 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 I vaguely remember thinking about this when I was writing this notebook and realizing that 1 to minus 1 made sense for some reason, but I can't remember what that reason was now. So let me get back to you about that during the week and remind me if I forget. Um, it's a good question, thank you. Okay, so we've got our generator and our discriminator. Um, so we need a function that returns um, a, a, a prior vector, so a bunch of noise. Um, so we do that by creating a bunch of zeros. Uh, nz is the size of z, so like very often in our code if you see a mysterious letter, it's because that's the letter they used in the paper. Right? So z is the size of our noise vector. Okay. Um, so there's the size of our noise vector, and then we use a normal distribution to generate random numbers inside that. Um, and that needs to be a variable because it's going to be participating in the in the gradient updates. Um, so here's an example of creating some noise, and so here are four different pieces of noise. Okay. So um, we need an optimizer uh, in order to uh, update um, our gradients. Um, in the Wasserstein GAN paper, they told us to use RMS prop, so that's fine. Right? So when you see this thing saying do an RMS prop update in a paper, that's nice. We can just do an RMS prop update with PyTorch. Okay? Um, and uh, they suggested a learning rate of 5e uh, neg5. I think I found 1e neg4 seemed to work, so I just made it a bit bigger. Um, so now we need a training loop. And so this is the thing that's going to implement this algorithm. So a training loop is going to go through some number of epochs that we get to pick, so that's going to be a parameter. Um, and so remember, when you do everything manually, you've got to remember all the manual steps to do. So one is that you have to set your modules into training mode when you're training them, and into evaluation mode when you're evaluating them, because in training mode, batch norm updates happen and dropout happens. In evaluation mode, those two things get turned off. Okay, so that's basically the difference. So put it into training mode. Um, we're going to grab an iterator from our training data loader. Um, we're going to see how many steps we have to go through, and then we'll use um, TQDM to give us a progress bar, and then we're going to go through that many steps. Okay, um, so the first step of this algorithm um, is to update the um, uh, is to update the discriminator. Um, so in this one, uh, I'm just trying to remember. Yes, they don't call it a discriminator; they call it a critic, right? So W are the weights of the of the critic. So the first step is to train our critic a little bit, and then we're going to train our generator a little bit, and then we're going to go back to the top of the loop, right? So this inner, so we've got a while loop on the outside, okay? So here's our while loop on the outside, and then inside that there's another loop for the critic, and so here's our little loop inside that for the critic, okay? We call it a discriminator. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try, we've got, uh, we've got a generator, um, and at the moment it's random. Right, so our generator is going to generate stuff that looks something like this, right? And so we need to first of all teach our discriminator to tell the difference between that and a bedroom, right? Which shouldn't be too hard, uh, you would hope. Um, so we just do it in basically the usual way, um, but there's a few little tweaks. So first of all, we're going to grab um, a mini batch of real bedroom photos, so we can just grab 
the next batch from our uh, iterator, turn it into a variable. Um, okay, um, then we're uh, going to calculate the loss for that, right? So this is going to be um, um, uh, how much does the discriminator think uh, this looks um, uh, this looks fake, right? Do the real ones look fake? Um, and then we're going to create some fake images, and to do that we'll create some random noise, and we'll stick it through our generator, which at this stage is just a bunch of random weights, okay? And that's going to create a mini batch of fake images, okay? And so then we'll put that through the same discriminator module as before, okay, to get the loss for that. So how fake do the fake ones look? Remember when you do everything manually, you have to zero the gradients uh, in, in your loop. Um, if you've forgotten about that, go back to the part one lesson where we do everything from scratch. Uh, so now finally, the uh, total uh, discriminator loss is equal to the real loss minus the fake loss. Okay, And so you can see that here. They don't talk about the loss, they actually just talk about what are the gradient updates. So this here is the symbol for get the gradients, right? So inside here is the loss, right? And like try to like learn to throw away in your head all of the boring stuff. So when you see sum over m divided by m, that means take the average. So just throw that away and replace it with np.mean in your head. There's another np.mean, right? So you want to get quick at like being able to see these common idioms. So anytime you see 1 over m, sum over m, you go, oh, okay, np.mean, right? So we're taking the mean of, and we're taking the mean of, so that's all fine. Um, xi, what's xi? It looks like it's x to the power of i, but it's not, right? The math notation is very overloaded. They showed us here what xi is, and it's a set of m samples from a batch of the real data. So in other words, this is a mini batch, right? So when the, when you see something saying sample, it means just grab a row, grab a row, grab a row, and you can see here grab it m times, and we'll call the first row x parenthesis one, the second row x parenthesis two. One of the annoying things about math notation is the the way that we um, index into arrays is um, Everybody uses different approaches, subscripts, superscripts, things in brackets, combinations, commas, square brackets, whatever, right? So you've just got to look in the paper and be like, okay, at some point they're going to say take the ith row from this matrix, or the ith image in this batch, how are they going to do it? In this case, it's a superscript in parentheses. Okay, so that's all sample means, and, and curly brackets means it's just a set of them. Um, this little uh, squiggle followed by um, something here means according to some probability distribution. Uh, and so in this case, like and very, very often in papers, it simply means, hey, you've got a bunch of data, right? Grab a bit from it at random. Okay, so that's like that's the the probability distribution of the data you have is the data you have. Right? So this says grab m things at random from your real data. This says grab m things at random from your prior samples, and so that means, in other words, um, call create noise to create m uh, random vectors. So now we've got m real images. Each one gets put through um, our discriminator. We've got m uh, bits of noise. Each one gets put through our generator to create uh, m um, generated images. Each one of those gets put through, look, fw, that's the same thing. So each one of those gets put through our discriminator to try and figure out whether they're fake or not. And so then it's this minus this and the mean of that. And then finally get the gradient of that in order to figure out how to use RMS prop to update our weights using some learning rate. Okay, so um, in PyTorch, um, we don't have to worry about getting the gradients. We can just specify the loss bit, okay, and then just say loss dot backward discriminator optimizer dot step.
Okay. Um, now there's one key step, right, which is that we have to um, keep all of our activations, uh, sorry, all of our weights, um, which are the parameters in a PyTorch module, in this small range between 0.01, uh, negative 0.01 and 0.01. Um, why? Because the mathematical assumptions that make this algorithm work only only apply in like a small ball, right? Um, so I'm not going to tell. I, I don't. I, I think it's kind of interesting to understand the math of why that's the case, but I, it's very specific to this one paper, and understanding it won't help you understand any other paper. So only study it. You know, if you're interested in, in, you know, I think it's nicely explained. I think it's fun, um, but it won't be information that you'll reuse uh, elsewhere unless you get super into GANs. I'll also mention after the paper came out, an improved Wasserstein GAN came out that said, "Hey, there are better ways to ensure that your um, that your weight space is in this tight ball, which was basically to kind of penalize um, gradients that are too high." Um, so actually, nowadays there are, there are slightly different ways to do this. Um, anyway, that's why this line of code there—it's kind of the key contribution. This, you know, this one line of code actually is the one line of code you add to make it a Wasserstein GAN, basically. Um, but the work was all in knowing like that that's the thing that you can do that makes everything work better. Okay, so at the end of this, we've got a discriminator that can recognize it in stream real bedrooms and our totally random crappy generated images. Um, so let's now try and create some better images. So now set trainable discriminator to false, uh, set trainable the generator to true, uh, zero out the gradients of the generator. And now our loss again is FW, that's the, that, remember that's the discriminator, of the generator applied to some more random noise. Okay, so here's our random noise, here's our generator, and here's our discriminator. Um, I think I can remove that now, um, because I think I've put it inside the discriminator, but I won't change it now because it's going to confuse me. Um, so it's exactly the same as before, where we did generator on the noise and then pass that to discriminator, but this time the thing that's trainable is the generator, not the discriminator. So in other words, in this uh, pseudocode, the thing they update is theta, uh, which is the generator's parameters, rather than w, which is the um, discriminator's parameters. And so hopefully you'll see now that this, this w down here is telling you these are the parameters of the discriminator. This theta down here is telling you these are the uh, actually better. These, this uh, theta here is telling you these are the parameters of the um, generator. Okay? And again, it's not a universal mathematical notation, it's a thing they're doing in this particular paper, but it's kind of nice when you see some, um, some suffix like that, is like try to think about what it's telling you. Okay? So we take some noise, generate some images, uh, uh, try and figure out if they're fake or real, and use that to get gradients with respect to okay, the generator, as opposed to earlier we got them with respect to the discriminator, and use that to update our weights with RMS prop with an alpha learning rate. Um, okay, you'll see that um, it's kind of unfair that the discriminator is getting trained n critic times, which they set to 5, for every time that we train the generator once. Um, and the paper talks a bit about this, but the basic idea is like there's no point making the generator better if the discriminator doesn't know how to discriminate yet. Okay, So that's why we've got this while loop. Um, and here's that 5, right? and actually something which um, was added, uh, I think, in the later paper, uh, uh, maybe a supplementary material, is the idea that um, from time to time, uh, and a bunch of times at the start, 
you should do more steps of the discriminator. So kind of make sure that the discriminator is pretty capable from time to time. Okay, so uh, do a bunch of epochs of training the discriminator a bunch of times to get better at telling the difference between real and fake, and then do one step of making the generator being better at generating, um, and that is an epoch. And so let's train that uh, for one epoch, um, and then let's create some noise so we can generate some examples. Um, Actually, we're going to do that later. Let's first of all uh, decrease the learning rate by 10 and do one more pass. So we've now done two epochs. Um, and now let's use our noise to pass it to our generator. Okay. Um, and then um, put it through our denormalization um, to turn it back into something we can see. And then um, plot it. And we have some bedrooms. Okay. And there's not real bedrooms, and some of them don't look particularly like bedrooms, but some of them look a lot like bedrooms. Um, so that's that's the idea. Okay, that's a GAN. And I think like the best way to think about a GAN is it's like a, an underlying technology that you'll probably never use like this, but you'll use in lots of interesting ways. For example, we're going to use it to create um, now a cycle gain. And we're going to use a cycle gain to turn horses into zebras. <coughs> you could also use it to turn Monet prints into photos, or to turn uh, photos of Yosemite in summer into winter. So it's going to be pretty... Um, yes, Rachel. Two questions. One, is there any reason for using RMS props specifically as the optimizer, optimizer as opposed to Atom? I, I, I don't remember it being explicitly discussed in the paper. I don't know if it's just experimental or there's theoretical reason. Um, yeah, have a look in the paper and see what it says. I don't recall. And which could be a reasonable way of detecting overfitting while training, or of evaluating the performance of one of these GAN models once we are done training? In other words, how does the notion of train validation test sets translate to GANs? <laughs> well, um, that's an awesome question. Um, and there's a lot of people who make jokes about how GANs is the one field where you don't need a test set, and people take advantage of that by making stuff up and saying it looks great. Um, um, there are some pretty famous problems with, with GANs. Um, one of the famous problems with GANs is called mode collapse. And mode collapse happens where you look at your bedrooms, and it turns out that there's basically only three kinds of bedrooms that every possible noise vector map to, and you look at your gallery, and it turns out, oh, it turns out they're all just the same thing. Well, there's just three different things. Um, mode collapse is easy to see if you collapse down to a small number of modes, like you know three or four. But what if you have a mode collapse down to ten thousand modes? So there's only ten thousand possible bedrooms that all of your noise vectors collapse to. That's not like you wouldn't be able to see it here, right? Because it's pretty unlikely you would have two identical bedrooms out of ten thousand. Or what if every one of these bedrooms is basically a direct copy? Of one of the, it was basically had memorized some input, you know, um, could that be happening? And the truth is, most papers don't do a good job, or sometimes any job, of checking those things. Um, so the question of like, how do we evaluate GANs, and even like the point of like, hey, maybe we should actually evaluate GANs properly, is something that is not widely enough understood even now, um, uh, and some people are trying to, you know, really push. So um, Ian Goodfellow, uh, who um, a lot of you will know because he uh, came and talk, spoke here at a lot of the book club meetings last year, and of course was the first author on the, the most famous deep learning book, uh, he, he's the inventor of GANs, and he's been sending uh, a continuous stream of tweets reminding people about the importance of testing GANs uh, properly. Um, so yeah, if you see a paper that claims exceptional 
scan results, then this is definitely something to look at. You know, is, is have they talked about mode collapse? Have they talked about memorization uh, and so forth? Okay, so um, this is going to be really straightforward because it's just a neural net, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to create uh, an input containing um, lots of zebra photos, and with each one we'll pair it with uh, an equivalent um, uh, uh, horse photo, and we'll just train a neural net that goes from one to the other. Or you could do the same thing for every Monet painting, create a, a data set containing the photo of the place. Oh, wait, that's not possible because the places that Monet painted aren't there anymore, and there aren't exact zebra versions of horses, and oh wait, how the hell is this going to work? This seems to break everything we know about what neural nets can do and how they do them. All right, Rachel, you're going to ask me a question to spoil our whole train of thought. Come on, better be good. C can GANs be used for data augmentation? Um, yeah, absolutely. You can use a GAN for data augmentation. Should you? <laughs> I don't know. Like, there are some papers that try to do semi-supervised learning with GANs. Uh, I haven't found any that are like particularly compelling, showing state-of-the-art results on really interesting data sets that have been widely studied. Um, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, and the reason I'm a little skeptical is because in my experience if you train a model with synthetic data, <coughs> the neural net will become fantastically good at recognizing the specific problems of your synthetic data, and that'll be end up what it's learning from. Um, and there are lots of other ways of doing semi-supervised models which do work well. Um, there are some places that it can work. For example, uh, you might remember um, Otavio Good created that fantastic visualization in part one of like the zooming convnet where it kind of showed a letter going through MNIST. Um, he, um, at least at that time, uh, had the uh, was, was the number one autonomous remote controlled car guy. Um, in, 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 in autonomous remote controlled car competitions, and he trained his model using um, synthetically augmented data, where he basically took real videos of, of, of a car driving around a circuit and added like fake people and fake other cars and stuff like that. And I think that worked well because, um, well, A, because he's kind of a genius, and B, because I think he had a kind of a well-defined kind of little subset that he had to work in. Um, 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 but yeah, in general, it's really hard. It's really, really hard to use synthetic data. I've tried using synthetic data in models for decades now, obviously not GANs because they're pretty new, but in general, it's very hard to do. Uh, very interesting research question. All right, so somehow uh, these folks at Berkeley created a model that can turn a horse into a zebra despite not having any photos, unless they went out there and painted horses and took before and after shots, but I, I believe they did it. Right? Um, so how the hell did they do this? Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of genius. Um, I will say the person I know who's doing the most interesting practice of CycleGAN right now is one of our students, uh, uh, Helena um, Saron. Uh, she's um, the only artist I know of who is a CycleGAN artist. Um, here's an example I love. She created this um, little doodle in the top left um, and then trained a CycleGAN to turn it into this beautiful painting in the bottom right. Um, uh, here are some more of her um, amazing works. Um, and I think it's really uh, interesting, like I, I, I mentioned at the start of this class that like GANs are in the category of like stuff that's not there yet, but it's nearly there. And in this case, like there's at least one person in the world now who's creating beautiful and extraordinary artworks using GANs. Um, and there's lots of, uh, specifically cycle GANs, and there's actually like at least maybe a dozen people I know of who are just doing interesting creative work with neural nets more generally, um, and the field of creative AI is going to expand um, dramatically. 
Um, and I think it's interesting with Helena. I, I mean, I don't know her personally, but from what I understand of her background, she's a um, you know she's a software developer, you know, as her full time job, and an artist as her hobby, and she's kind of started combining these two by saying, gosh, I wonder what this particular tool could bring to my art. And so if you follow her Twitter account, we'll make sure we add it um, on the wiki. Um, um, if somebody can find it, it's Helena Saren. Uh, Saren. Um, she basically posts a new work almost every day. Um, and they're always uh, pretty amazing. Um, um, so here's the basic trick. Okay, and this is from the CycleGAN paper. We're going to have two um, kind of uh, two images, assuming we're doing this with images, right? But the key thing is they're not paired images, so we're not we don't have a data set of horses and the equivalent zebras. We've got bunch of horses, bunch of zebras. Grab one horse, grab one zebra. Okay, we've now got an X. So X, let's say X is horse and Y is zebra. We're going to train a generator, and what they call here a mapping function, that turns horse into zebra. We'll call that mapping function G. And we'll create one mapping function, generator, that turns a zebra into a horse, and we'll call that F. We'll create a discriminator, uh, just like we did before, which is going to get as good as possible at recognizing real from fake horses. So that'll be DX. And then another discriminator, which is going to be as good as possible and recognizing um, real from fake zebras. We'll call that dy. Okay, so that's kind of our starting point. Um, but then the key thing to making this worse work. Okay, so so we've, we're, we're kind of generating a loss function here, right? Here's one bit of the loss function. Here's a second bit of the loss function. We're going to create something called cycle consistency loss, which says after you turn your horse into a zebra with your g generator um, and check whether or not I can recognize that it's real. Um, so I keep forgetting which one's horse and which one's zebra. I apologize if I get my X's and Y's backwards. I turn my horse into a zebra and then going to try and turn that zebra back into the same horse that I started with. Right? And so then I'm going to have another function that's going to check whether my um, this a uh, horse, which I've generated knowing nothing about X, generated entirely from this zebra, is similar to the original horse or not. Right? So the idea would be, if your generated zebra doesn't look anything like your original horse, you've got no chance of turning it back into the original horse. So a loss which compares X hat to X is going to be really bad, unless you can go into Y and back out again, and you're probably only going to be able to do that if you're able to create a zebra that looks like the original horse, so that you know what the original horse looked like. And vice versa, take the original, take your zebra, turn it into a fake horse, and check that you can recognize that, and then try and turn it back into the original zebra, and check that it looks like the original. So notice here, this F, right, is our zebra to horse. This G is our horse to zebra, right? So, so the G and the F are kind of doing two things. They're both turning the original horse into the zebra, and then turning the zebra back into the original horse. Okay, so notice that there's only two generators, right? There isn't a separate generator for the reverse mapping. You have to use the same generator that was used for the original mapping. Okay, so this is uh, the cycle consistency loss, and I just think this is like this is genius, you know, like the, the, the idea that this is a thing that could be even be possible. Uh, honestly, when this came out, it just never occurred to me as a thing that I could even try and solve. It seems so obviously impossible. And then the idea that you can solve it like this, I just think it's, it's so damn smart. So um, it's good to look at the equations in this paper, because um, they're just good example. Like they're written pretty simply. Uh, you know, there's, it's not like some of the stuff in the Wasserstein GAN paper, which is like <coughs> lots of theoretical proofs and whatever else. In this case, they're you know they're just equations that just lay out what's going on, and you really want to get to a point where you where you can read them and understand them. So like, let's kind of start talking through them. 
So we've got a horse and a zebra. Okay. Uh, so for some mapping function um, G, okay, which is our horse to zebra mapping function, then there's a GAN loss, right, which is the bit we're already familiar with. It says I've got a horse, a zebra, um, a fake zebra recognizer, and a horse to zebra generator. Okay, and the loss is exact. It's it's what we saw before. It's our ability to draw uh, one zebra out of our zebras, okay, and um, recognize whether it's real or fake, okay, and then generate a uh, take a um, horse and turn it into a zebra and recognize whether that's real or fake. Okay, and then you're, you then do one minus the other, and in this case they've got a log in there. Um, the log's not terribly important. So this is this is the thing we just saw. Right? So that's why we did Wasserstein GAN first. Is this is just a a standard GAN loss in math form? Did you have a question, Rachel? All of this sounds awfully like translating in one language to another, then back to the original. Have GANs or any equivalent been tried in translation? Not that I, uh, not that I know of. Um, I wonder if Aza's here because I know yeah, he's been well, working someone, on this. Someone has posted the link to the yeah. unsupervised. Yeah, because there's the un there's 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 unsupervised machine translation, which um, does kind of do something like this, but I don't I haven't looked at it closely enough to know if it's nearly identical or if it's just vaguely similar. But yeah, there. So to kind of back up to what I do know, um, normally with translation you require this kind of paired input, you require parallel texts, you know, this is the French translation of this English sentence. Um, I do know there's been a, a couple of recent papers that show the ability to create uh, good quality translation models without uh, paired data. Um, I haven't uh, implemented them and I don't understand anything I haven't implemented, but yeah, they may well be doing the same basic um, idea. Um, we'll look at it during the week and get back to you. Um, okay. Um, all right, so uh, we've got our GAN loss. The next piece is the cycle consistency loss, right? And so the basic idea here is that uh, we start with our horse, use our zebra generator on that to create a zebra, use our horse generator on that to create a horse, and then compare that to the original horse, and this double lines with a 1, we've seen this before, this is the L1 loss. Okay, So this is the sum of the absolute value of differences. Or else if this was a 2, it would be the uh, L2 loss, or the 2 norm, um, which would be the sum of squared differences, uh, the square root of it, actually. Um, and again, we now know this squiggle idea, Okay, which is from our um, horses grab a horse. Okay, that's so. This is what we mean by sample from a distribution. There's all kinds of distributions, but most commonly in these papers we're using an empirical distribution. In other words, we've got some rows of data. Grab a row. Okay, so when you see this thing, squiggle, other thing, this thing here, when it says p data, that means grab something from the data, and we're going to call that thing. X. So from our horses pictures, grab a horse, turn it into a zebra, turn it back into a horse, compare it to the original, and sum up the absolute values. Okay, do that for horse to zebra, do it for zebra to horse as well, um, add the two together, and that is our cycle consistency loss. Um, okay, so now we get our loss function, and the whole loss function depends on our horse generator, our zebra generator, our horse recognizer, our zebra recognizer, discriminator, and we're going to add up the GAN loss for um, recognizing horses, the GAN loss for recognizing zebras, and the cycle, co cycle consistency loss for our two generators. Okay, And then we've got a lambda here, um, which hopefully we're kind of used to this idea now, that is when you've got two different kinds of loss, um, you chuck in uh, a parameter there, 
that you can multiply them by so that they're about, about the same scale. Okay, and we did a similar thing with our bounding box um, uh, loss compared to our classifier loss when we did um, that localization stuff. Okay, um, so then we're going to try to uh, for this mac for this loss function uh, maximize the capability of the discriminators that are discriminati discriminating uh, whilst um, uh, minimizing that for the generators. So the generators and the discriminators are going to be facing off against each other. So when you see this min max uh, thing in papers, you'll see it a lot. It means it, it all it basically means this idea that in your training loop one thing is trying to make something better, the other is trying to make something worse, and you generally, there's lots of ways to do it, but most commonly you will alternate between the two. And you'll often see this just referred to in math papers as min-max. Okay, so when you see min-max, you think, you should immediately think, okay, adversarial training. Um, so let's look at the code. Um, and we're only going to, um, we probably won't be able to finish this today, um, but we're going to do something um, almost unheard of, which is um, I started looking at somebody else's code, and I was not so disgusted that I threw the whole thing away and did it myself. I actually said, I quite like this. I like it enough, I'm going to show it to my students. Um, so um, uh, this is um, where the code comes from. Um, so this is uh, one of the people that created the original uh, code for Cyclegans, uh, and they've uh, created a PyTorch version, um, and um, I had to clean it up a little bit, but it's actually pretty damn good. Um, it's, I think, the first time I found code that I didn't feel the need to rewrite from scratch before I showed it to you. Um, and so the cool thing about this is. Um, one of the reasons I liked doing it this way of like finally finding something that's not awful is um, that you're now going to get to see almost all the bits of fast AI or like all the relevant bits of fast AI written in a different way by somebody else, right? And so you're going to get to see like, oh, how they do data sets and data loaders and models and um, training loops and so forth, okay? So um, you'll find there's a CGAN uh, directory, um, which is basically nearly this, um, with some cleanups which I hope to submit as a PR sometime to, um, it was written in a way that unfortunately made it a bit over-connected to how they were using it as a script, but I so cleaned it up a little bit so I could use it as a module, um, but other than that it's pretty similar. So CGAN is basically uh, their code, um, uh, copied from uh, their um, from their GitHub repo with some minor changes. Um, so uh, the way the CGAN um, mini library has been set up is that the configuration options they're assuming are being passed in to like a script. Um, so they've got this train options parser method. Um, and so you can see I'm basically pass passing in an array of like script options. Okay. Um, where's my data? How many threads do I want drop out? How many iterations? Um, what am I going to call this model? Um, which GPU do I want to write it on? Okay, um, so that gives me a opt um, um, object, which you can then see, uh, all, you know, what it contains. You'll see that it contains some things I didn't mention, and that's because it's got defaults for everything else that I didn't mention. Okay, so. Um, we're going to, uh, rather than using fast AI stuff, we're going to largely use CGAN stuff. So the first thing we're going to need is a data loader. And so this is also a great opportunity for you, again, to practice your ability to navigate through code with your um, editor or IDE of choice. Um, so we're going to start with create data loader. Uh, so you should be able to go find symbol or um, in Vim, tag. Uh, to jump straight to create data loader, uh, and we can see that's creating a custom data set loader, and then we can see custom data set loader is a base data loader. Okay, so that doesn't really do anything. Uh, it creates, uh, okay, so basically we can see that it's going to use um, a standard PyTorch data loader. So that's good. 
And so we know if you're going to use a standard PyTorch data loader, you have to pass it a data set. And we know that a data set is something that contains a length and a, um, an indexer. Uh, so presumably, when we look at create data set, it's going to do that. Here is create data set. Okay, so this uh, library actually does more than just CycleGAN. Um, it handles both aligned and unaligned image pairs. Uh, we know that our image pairs are unaligned. Um, so we've got an unaligned data set. Okay, here it is. And as expected, it has a get item and a length. Good. Um, and so the main, obviously, the main, uh, the length is just uh, whatever of our. So A and B is our horses and zebras. Uh, we've got two sets. Um, so whichever one is longer is the length of the data loader. And so get item is just going to go ahead and um, randomly uh, grab something from uh, each of our uh, two uh, horses and zebras, open them up with pillow or PAL. Uh, run them through some transformations um, and then we could either be turning horses into zebras or zebras into horses so there's some uh, direction and then it'll just go ahead and then return our horse and our zebra uh, and our path to the horse and the path to the zebra. So um, yeah, hopefully you can kind of see that this is looking pretty similar to the kind of stuff that FastAI um, does. Um, FastAI obviously does quite a lot more when it comes to transforms and uh, performance and stuff like this. But, you know, remember this is like research code for this one thing. Like it's pretty cool that they did all this work. So we've got a data loader. Um, so we can go and load our data into it. Um, and so that'll tell us how many mini batches are in it. That's the length of a data loader in um, PyTorch. Uh, next step, we've got a data loader is to create um, a model. Um, so you can go ta uh, go tag for uh, create model. There it is. Okay, same idea. We've got uh, different kinds of models, so we're going to be doing a cycle GAN. So here's our cycle GAN model. Okay, so there's quite a lot of stuff in a cycle GAN model. So let's go through and find out um, what's going to be used. Um, but basically, um, at this stage. Um, We've just called initializer, um, and so when we initialize it, um, you can see it's going to go through and it's going to define two generators, uh, which is not surprising, a generator for our horses and a generator for our zebras. Um, uh, let's see what else we've got here. Um, okay, there's some way for it to generate a pool of fake data, um, and then here we're going to grab our um, our GAN loss, and as we talked about, our cycle consistency loss is an L1 loss. Um, that's interesting, they're going to use Atom, um, so um, obviously for cycle GANs, um, they found Atom works pretty well. Um, and so then we're going to have an optimizer for our horse discriminator, an optimizer for our zebra discriminator, and an optimizer for our generator. Okay, um, the optimizer for the generator is going to contain the parameters both for the horse generator and the zebra generator all in one place. So, okay, so the initializer is going to set up all of the different networks and loss functions we need, and they're all going to be stored uh, <coughs> inside this model. And so then it prints out and shows us exactly the PyTorch models we have. And so it's interesting to see that they're using ResNets. And so you can see the ResNets look uh, pretty familiar. Uh, we've got um, conf batch norm ralu, conf batch norm. So instance norm is just the same as batch norm, basically, um, but it applies it to one image at a time. Um, the difference isn't particularly important. Um, okay, uh, and you can see they're doing um, reflection padding. Um, uh, just like we are. Um, and you can kind of see like when you when you try to build everything from scratch like this, it is a lot of work and you know, you can kind of to get the little you know, the nice little things that uh, FastAI does automatically for you, you kind of have to do all of them by hand and only end up with a subset of them. Um, so, you know, over time, hopefully soon we'll get all of uh, this GAN stuff into FastAI and it'll be nice and easy. 
Um, okay, so we've got our model and remember the model contains the loss functions It contains the generators it contains the discriminators um, all in one convenient place So I've gone ahead and kind of uh, copied and pasted and slightly refactored um, The training loop from the from their code so that we can run it inside the notebook So this will all look pretty familiar, right? Uh, it's a loop to go through each epoch and a loop to go through um, the data um, before we did this we set up our um, uh, This is actually not a PyTorch data set. I think this is what they used slightly confusingly to talk about their You know their combined what we would call a model data object. I guess all the data that they need um, Flip through that with TQDM to get a progress bar um, And so now we can go through and see what happens in the model, right? So set input so set input So um, So it's kind of a different approach to what we do in fast AI um, uh, it, This is kind of neat, you know, it's quite specific to cycle GANs, but basically internally Inside this model is this idea that we're going to go into our um, Data and grab, you know, we're knowing when we're, we're either going horse to zebra or zebra to horse depending on which way we go we either you know a is either the horse or the zebra and Vice versa, and if necessary, put it on the appropriate GPU, um, and then grab the appropriate um, parts. Okay, so the model now has uh, uh, a mini batch of horses and a mini batch of zebras, um, and so now we optimize the parameters. Okay, so. Um, it's kind of nice to see it like this. You can see each step, right? So first of all, uh, try to um, uh, optimize the generators, then try to optimize the horse discriminator, then try to optimize the zebra discriminator. Zero grad is part of PyTorch. Step is part of PyTorch. So the interesting bit is the actual thing that calculate, which does the backpropagation on the generator. So here it is um, And let's jump to the key pieces um, There's all the bits all the formula that we basically just saw uh, from the paper um, so let's take a horse and um, Generate a zebra So we've now got a fake zebra and let's now use the discriminator to see if we can tell whether it's fake or not Okay, so there's pred fake and then um, let's pop that into our um, loss function, which um, uh, uh, We set up earlier um, To see if we can um, Basically to get a, a loss function based on that prediction um, Then let's do the same thing to do the GAN loss so take a uh, go in the opposite direction uh, and then we need to use the opposite discriminator and then put that through the um, Loss function again, and then let's do the uh, cycle consistency loss. Okay, so again we take our fake, which we created up here, okay, and try and turn it back again into the original, and then let's use that loss function or cycle consistency loss function we created earlier to compare it to the real original, and here's that lambda, right? So there's some um, uh, weight that we used and that was set up actually uh, we just used the default that they suggested in their options and then do the same for the opposite direction and then add them all together um, Do the backward step um, And that's it so we can then do the same thing for the first discriminator uh, And since basically all the work's been done now um, uh, there's much less to do here um, Okay, so um, there that is um, so I won't step all through it, but it's basically the same same basic stuff that we've already seen uh, So optimize parameters uh, Basically is calculating the losses and uh, doing the optimizer step uh, from time to time save and print out some results um, and then from time to time 
uh, update the learning rate. So they've got some learning rate annealing built in here as well. Um, isn't very exciting, but um, we can take a look at it. Okay, so they've basically got some kind of like fast AI. They've got this idea of schedulers, um, which you can then use to update your learning rates. Um, so I think kind of like, you know, for those of you who are interested in better understanding um, deep learning APIs or interested in contributing more to fast AI or interested in like creating, you know, so, uh, your own version of some of this stuff in some different backend, it's cool to like look at a second kind of API that covers some subset of some of the similar things to get a sense for how are they solving some of these problems and what are the similarities and what are the differences. Um, so we train that for a little while um, and then we can uh, just grab um, uh, a few uh, examples and uh, here we have them. Uh, so here are our horses, here they are as zebras, and here they are back as horses again. Here's a, ho a zebra into a horse, back into a zebra, it's kind of thrown away its head for some reason, but not so much it couldn't get it back again. Um, this is a really interesting one, like this is obviously not what zebras look like, but if it's going to be a zebra version of that horse. It's also interesting to see its failure situations, I guess it doesn't very often see basically just an eyeball, it has no idea how to do that one. Um, uh, so some of them don't work very well, this one's done a pretty good job. This one's interesting, it's done a good job of that one and that one, but for some reason the one in the middle didn't get to go. Um, yeah, this one's a really weird shape, but it's done a reasonable job of it. This one looks good. This one's pretty sloppy. Again, the fork just ahead. It's not bad. So, you know, um, I didn't, I tr it took me quite a, it took me like 24 hours to train it even that far. Um, so it's kind of slow. Um, and I know Helena is constantly complaining on Twitter about how um, long these things take. I don't know how she's so productive with them. Um, so, yeah, uh, I will mention one more thing that just um, came out um, yesterday, um, which is there's now a multimodal image-to-image -image translation of Unpaired, um, and so you can basically now create different cats, um, for instance, um, from this doc. Um, so this is basically <laughs> not just creating one example of the output that you want, but creating multiple ones. So here's a house cat to big cat, um, and here's a big cat to house cat. Um, this is the paper here. So this came out like yesterday or the day before, I think. Um, I think it's pretty amazing. Cat and a dog. Um, so you can kind of see how this technology is developing, and I think, you know, if you are, there's so many opportunities to you know, maybe do this with music, or speech, or writing, or to create kind of tools for artists, or whatever. All right, thanks everybody, and uh, see you next week.